there is a concept called specific strength. And I don't want to spend too much time on this one, just to give you an idea that this was understood by somebody so long ago. You know him, right? Yeah. What did he do? Many things. Amongst them, he also realized the concept of specific strength. Specific strength is the strength that a material can take by its own weight. For example, if you take a steel bar and you make it very long and keep making it very long, then at one point the self weight of the bar will break the bar. So that strength which is related to its own carrying weight carrying capacity, that is called specific strength. And that is a very important property because it shows you how efficient the material is. So very good material has high specific strength. That means they are they can carry other loads. Otherwise, some material can only carry their own load, cannot carry anything else. For example, concrete the intention specific strength is very small. You make a concrete up sometimes it will just break by itself and cannot carry any load. Steel, higher. Aluminium, higher, because its weight is less. So it can have a higher specific strength. And some material very high specific, like carbon fiber, right? Things like that. So we are looking for materials which have high specific strength. That means they can they can carry a lot of their own length or weight before they break. And that gives us the opportunity to carry other loads higher than. For example, bridge, long bridge, they are mostly designed to carry their own weight. The life load is not important. Any bridge which span is more than 50 meters is controlled by the self weight. The truck load is too small compared to the self weight of the bridge. That means bridge is basically carrying its own weight. And then the life load is free. So that means if we can improve that performance, we can use lighter material with higher strength, we can reduce that effect and we can make the structures more efficient. So that is the reason specific strength is important. But this cannot, this is not something that we can control a lot. Only when choosing the material, we should look for materials with high specific strength so that the self weight is not causing it to lose all of its effectiveness in cal calculating the load. So I don't want to spend too much time on it. There are some slides here you can see, for example, this is the bar, that is the cross section area, this is the length. So if you keep increasing, the total length, weight of the bar at this point will be force, right? Divided by the area of cross section will be stress. And if that stress becomes larger than the material strength, this will break. So this length will determine, cross section size doesn't matter because it's the same. It doesn't matter. Length is important. So how long you can go before it breaks by its own weight will determine specific length or specific strength. And then you can easily calculate that based on the, the situation. Calculate the weight, calculate the stress, and then from the length, you can relate the length to the specific strength. So it becomes a function of the length a bar can carry. Because cross-section area and weight are related to each other. Increasing the cross-section area does not help. Reducing the cross-section area does not, does not also change because the weight also depends on the area. Right? Length is the only parameter. That's why sometimes, Engineers get into this loop of the design which they do not understand. For example, when you will study later flat slab design, in flat slab design sometimes you have a problem with shear, punching shear. And people increase the thickness of the slab to reduce the effect of punching shear. But it doesn't help because when you increase the thickness, you increase the weight, the shear force does not reduce as much. right? The parameter increases a little bit, but the effect is not so useful. So you cannot increase thickness in that case to solve this problem efficiently. It can solve a little bit, but not so good. Similarly, in many other situations, things like that can happen, that adding, changing the cross-section does not solve the problem. It only makes it worse because of the specific strength problem. So it is impossible to, co to construct structures of enormous size. There is a limit how big you can make it, right? And that is controlled by the specific strength. So you cannot think of making a structure too big by increasing the member sizes. 
it just doesn't work that way. We have to think of other ways to do that. And these are some of the comparisons of the specific strengths the various materials. And it changes based on direction. Compression and tension, for example, a stone. Compression, that much. And tension, that much. So you can see that a stone, you can make nearly seven kilometer high stone column before it starts to break under its own weight. Seven kilometers, 7,000 meters, right? Very tall. So stone is very strong in that area and in, in that way. So you can really build, that's why old structures, you know, build, all things can be built. And others, in this one, tension will be less and so on. So this is the way we can see how the specific strength can vary the effectiveness of the material. So that's why based on specific strength, we use them for corresponding usage. Stone, brick, concrete for compression, steel in tension, timber in tension is good, aluminium is very good in tension, aircraft is carry so originally they used wood. Balsa wood, for example, is very light. You know balsa wood, right? Balsa wood? Anybody do modeling? Aeroplanes? Models? No? No one interested in that kind of thing? Okay. If you have any interest in aeroplanes, people used to make models and put a motor and fly them around with a remote control. No. Nobody. Okay. There normally we used to use balsa wood. So balsa wood is extremely light, extremely light, but quite strong. So the specific strength of balsa wood is one of the highest in the world because it has almost no weight and it has very good strength. So the the model air, airplanes that you fly with small motor were made from balsa wood. Also, if you do wind tunnel testing in your thesis or somewhere, some we make the building models from balsa wood because we want to make the models which have no mass because we don't want mass to act with that. So very stiff, massless structures. So you construct them in balsa wood. Very strong, very stiff, no mass. So balsa wood is a very good material for modeling, creating models. Then also, ductility. We will talk about ductility now. So we talked about stiffness, we talked about strength, specific strength. Now let's talk about ductility. Ductility, what is ductility? Who can define ductility? Somebody gave a very good definition of stiffness. What about ductility? What do you understand when I say something is ductile and brittle? What, do you, what comes to your mind? Does brittle mean weak in strength? Does ductile mean high in strength? Do they have relationship with each other? If I say something is brittle, what does it mean? It's weak. Does it mean it's weak? So brittle is a material which may have very high strength, but when it reaches its strength value, it breaks or fails immediately or quickly or without warning or suddenly. So it's brittle. That means it, it has it has no warning before it breaks. It reaches its value just before value. Everything seems fine, and it reaches its specific strength or strength. The strength it just breaks suddenly, right? But does not mean it's weak. It could be very strong but brittle. Ductility is that when you when you apply load, it starts to deform and keeps on deforming for a long time before it breaks. So it's ductile, right? But ductile doesn't mean it can it can have, have high strength. It may be very very weak and ductile, right? Very soft material. It starts to and after it breaks, but it gives you a lot of warning. So it, ductile means that it has a lot of deformation before breaking. So between yielding and breaking, there is a lot of deformation. Brittle, there is no deformation between yielding and breaking. So it yields and breaks. And ductile yields and continues to deform and breaks after a while. So it gives you a lot of warning. So in structures, we prefer, what kind of materials do we prefer? 
that time. Of course, obvious. We don't want brittle materials because they give no warning. And they may seem very fine today, and tomorrow they're gone. <coughs> there was a building in Thailand many years ago, and people have been living in there for a very long time, and everything was fine. And no warning, nothing. One day, it just came down. Killed 117 people inside. No warning. Everything is fine. And then suddenly one day, it collapsed. Without warning, without information, without anything. Because the columns had reached their compressive limit. And compression failure in column and concrete is brittle. So it just went away. So we want to avoid brittle behavior. And that is why we want to use the ductility. So some materials are brittle, some are ductile, some are very ductile. Stone, brittle. This one, not applicable because there are many problems. Wood cannot be considered, it depends on dry, wet, direction. So, it, uh, you know, a branch of tree is ductile, and the wood could be brittle depending on where you load it. Brittle, large ductility, moderate ductility, low ductility, and ductile. So, large ductility is mild steel, and then low ductility, moderate. So, this is what now we want to talk about ductility. How can we deal with materials or how can we make materials and not only materials but cross sections and structures which are ductile. It is possible to use a brittle material and make the cross section ductile and it is possible to use a brittle cross section and make the structure ductile because we can add ductility to other levels. Remember there are three levels, material, cross section and member. So you can add ductility at different levels, right? So that is a trick. How where do we add ductility into the structure? So even brittle materials, structures made from brittle materials can be made ductile. But our job today for this lecture is to make the materials ductile or deal with the ductility of the materials because it's best to have ductile materials. So, utility is important for ultimate behavior of structure, that means performance. A ductile material will sustain large deformation before collapsing, warning the people inside. Right? So, ductile structure, ductile material will be very good. It, it deforms a lot and sometimes doesn't even collapse, it just deforms, it doesn't fall down. And a ductile material's biggest advantage, a ductile structure material's biggest advantage is this. It gives the opportunity for redistribution of forces. This is very, very important. For example, two members started together and one, let's say, there is one platform or one uh, slab which is supported by hangers, four hangers, right? And if one of the hanger is overloaded for some reason or is too small, it might deform but if it is ductile, it will allow the other hangers to take the load and redistribute forces because it will not break, it will carry on certain loading and deform. But because it deforms, the load will shift to other hangers and the load will, the structure will not fail because it will still carry its own capacity at the given point. So redistribution of forces, redistribution of moments, redistribution of the load, load paths is very important. That's why we prefer ductile materials and ductility a lot, especially in earthquake resistant structures. In fact, the earthquake, most important property of the, the structure is ductility. Strength, we don't care that much. We care about ductility a lot. And we will talk about it later, why. So, let's look for ductility in stress strain curves. <coughs> This is the British code stress strain curve for concrete, idealized, not real, idealized. So they say that the stress strain curve starts like this and after some time it deviates and becomes non-linear and becomes here and then becomes straight and then after that, what happened? But it should drop, they should show breaking, breaking means stress drops to zero. Right? But they don't say anything. 
because we don't know honestly we don't exactly we cannot plot this portion here because it's, it's brittle right it just goes we don't know what happened the load doesn't drop it just disappears so suddenly the stress strain curve stops in reality it should gradually come down to zero right so that it gives us warning for unloading and load reduction in this redistribution but here it just goes there and disappears and this is a strange stress strain curve it should not be like this but anyway we'll come back to it later so this is the way a stress strain curve in British code will look like that is the portion which is defined as flat and this strain is defined at 0 0.0035 and it is said that this is the failure strain and after that we do not know what will happen so we limit our structure's design in such a way that the strain, maximum strain, does not exceed 0 0.0035. And different building codes have different limit. Anybody know what's the limit in ACI? 0 0.003. Correct, 0 0.003. Right? So ACI places it a little bit less here. But concrete is concrete, right? So again, the same question. You make a concrete here in the lab, it doesn't care which code, which strain it should crack, it will crack on a certain strain, right? It could be 0 0.003, it could be 0 0.02, 0 0.035, 0 0.28, we don't, we, so we cannot tell the concrete to follow a particular code, but two codes have different opinion about the same concrete, made in the same way, in the same lab, with same everything, right? That is the problem with codes that they make these limits which seem quite arbitrary. And this curve also has a different shape, a different code. We will look at some more curves. Right? But the point is that the stress and strain are related to each other by formula. In this portion, this formula governs this, this is the stiffness, starting stiffness, stiffness will change, stiffness will become zero here, right? In this portion. These are some more concrete models. In fact, there has been a time when everybody wanted to do research on this topic. Find out the stress strain first, stress strain curve for concrete. And many people came up with different curves for the same concrete. And so many curves have been proposed and developed over the years. Right? Okay. So this is one curve which has this formula, this equation. It goes like this, goes like this, comes down here and stops here at a strain of 0.0038. Not 35, 38. Another one goes to 0.035. Another one has no value. This is a value calculated by some formula. And this is another curve. And this one is 0.003. Right? So you can see that strain, ultimate strain has no unique value, depends on the person who developed the curve, depends on the code which adopted. So in reality, the stress strain curve could be very different. None of them are true, actually, obviously, because all of them cannot be true. So by their definition, none of them is true, correct? Because only one of them can be true, because it's concrete has one behavior. Because there are so many, so none of them by definition, by logic, can be true. All of them are approximations, different approximations of the behavior of concrete. Some more. Linear, Whitney, PCA, PS, Mender 2, Mender 1, unconfined parabolic. So I can go on 30, 40 different curves I can show you from literature that people have developed. And we have been always trained to believe in ACI code, this is the one that we follow, Whitney, which is a very funny curve. It's not even a curve. It's a bunch of straight lines. So it starts, it doesn't go like this. It has an offset here. And goes straight like this, goes straight like that. Obviously, concrete is not going to do this. So why is ACI giving us this curve, which is not even close to true? Because it's easy to calculate the stress diagram, rectangle, right? And, and calculation. 
that's the only reason. Otherwise, it has no logic. So in, in real calculations, we never use ACI. We cannot use ACI. It is so, so, in, so unrealistic that it is not even considered in calculations of the capacities. These are better, parabolic of various kinds. These are more real. This is goes up and goes down as a complete loop. Right? So that is better. And then Mender comes down, another Mender goes up, has a lot of activity. Mender, this guy, Mender, did a lot of research. And he did a long, a long time ago, and we still believe him because his research was very, very strong, and his models for concrete are considered to be more reliable than most. And we still use them for calculation. I will show you later what he did. So that is about concrete. Steel has all these curves also. Steel behavior has even more complication in some, some way than concrete because normally we assume steel to be like this. We assume, assume steel to be elastoplastic. That means it has this plastic range and then suddenly becomes plastic and that is the ductility and it, this value is actually this is ductility from here to here. This length is ductility from yielding to failure. And for steel, this can be as large as as large as how big? Any idea? Anyone? Ductility of steel. How much is it can expand before it breaks after it yields? Ratio of this strain over this strain. How big? That is ductility. This could be as, as high as 20, 25. So steel has a very high ductility, right? Ductility of steel, that means the ratio between this strain over that can be very large, up to 20, 20 times the yield. So it really can become very long before it breaks. Concrete, on the other hand, has a ductility of one or two. Very small, right? Sometimes one, sometimes two. So it is not good, but <coughs> We can make concrete with a ductility of as high as 10 or even more. It's possible. Right? And we will see how. So normal concrete has a very low ductility, one or two. But we can create, and this is the steel in reality. This one, and then it goes up and then goes up there. So it has a behavior which is called strain hardening. After a lot of strain, it becomes hard and again its stiffness becomes larger and it continues again. So steel is strange. When you put a lot of load on it, it first reaches the yield, then it starts to yield, becomes soft and after some point it starts to become hard again and goes again up. So that is called strain hardening. So steel has that ability to go to that level and instead of breaking, it starts to become strong again. Right? And this is that curve is showing that behavior, various forms of that behavior. And we can utilize this strain hardening portion to do many things. People have utilized very intelligently this portion and created many new types of steel with no utility but high strength, right? Because if you remove this portion and make it continuous, that means you can get a very high strength steel without any yielding. But it becomes less tactile, but more high strength. And now that is banned. That trick is no longer allowed. Somebody found that trick and they used, this used to be called TOR steel, top steel. And they take the steel and they twist it. And by twisting, they pre yield it and skip this part and connect that here. So you, you get a very high strength steel for the same material, but more ductility, less ductility. But then there was an earthquake in Mexico in 1994, if I remember correctly, and a lot of buildings got damaged that used that tall steel. So after that, 
it was disallowed. Now you cannot use tar steel in earthquake zones. It must be mild steel. Okay. So this is the behavior of a mild steel. This portion and that one. So it will be like this. You will also find that we do not like high strength steel. High strength steel is not good. But not today, we will discuss later. This is what I was talking about. So, different materials have been created. This is the grade 40 steel, grade 60 steel, grade 75 steel. High strength steels have been created, which have, which have different, less ductility, higher strength. And this one, grade 75, has less ductility, no clear ductility, but there's that. So, these different steel grades have been created, and they are good, but a lot of people do not allow the use of steel higher than 60. 75 is sometimes not allowed, or more than 75 is not allowed. So depending upon the, the core, depending upon the region, they do not allow high strength steel. High strength steel actually is not good. We will find it later. This is good, but it's too low. This is optimal, so grade 60 steel is often used as the most appropriate reinforcement in concrete. Right? For this is good for a good compromise between strength and ductility. It has ductility, it has good strength. Grade 40 has the largest ductility. So 18 to 20 percent here is a lot, which is very, very large. So let's now get back to concrete. Concrete behavior and confinement. So now what we want to do basically is to make the concrete a ductile material. Right? Now imagine sand, right? You if I bring some sand here and I put it here, what will happen to the sand? It will just spread on the table and flow away, right? If I put a cylinder, steel cylinder or a glass cylinder, and I put sand in it, what will happen to the sand? It will stay there, right? It will not go anywhere. And if I put some load on the sand, what will happen? If I take the sand and I put it in a glass or a container, steel container, and then I put some weight on the, on the sand, what will happen? Actually not. Sand is cannot, you will not be able to compress sand. That's the funny part. You cannot compress sand. But it will carry the load. Sand, when it is in a container, it starts to carry the load. A lot of load on the sand, nothing will happen. It will not settle and that you can keep on putting a lot of load on it. What happened? How did that happen? How can we create a material which is so weak that it cannot sustain itself and we put it in a container and now it can carry a lot of load? Poisson's ratio, confinement. Because when you put the load on the sand, it is trying to flow on the side, but it cannot flow on the side because there's a container. So the container is pushing back. So now sand cannot go anywhere. So if it cannot go anywhere, it cannot go down. So it cannot go down, it can carry the load. As simple as that. Right? So by simply putting the sand, which is a very, otherwise it means nothing, and confining the sand or putting it in a container, we are able to make it into a load carrying material. And that is why, I don't know if you know about the sand piles. Do you know about sand piles? Ever heard the word term sand piles? Okay, later. We use a term called sand piles to carry the load. Anyway, so basically what we are saying is that if I can take the... So same is the case with concrete. Right? This specimen, it broke. When we put the compression on it, it broke. Right? And if I put something around that, that it cannot go out, 
actually I cannot crash concrete, just like sand. So if I contain the concrete in some container, then it is almost impossible for concrete to crush because it cannot crush until it moves out and if it is contained it cannot move out. So where can it go? It cannot disappear, right? For something to go down it must go on the side, material like that. So which means that if I can confine the concrete or contain the concrete on the sides, I can increase the strength significantly. And if I contain it in a way that it expands slowly, I can increase the ductility. Because for concrete to, to compress, it must expand this way. And if the confinement is steel, it will also expand a little bit slowly. And if this yields, concrete will also have the same ductility phenomena as steel. Because the material which is confining, it has ductility. Right? So if you push, push down, it will push sideways. When it's pushed sideways, the steel will have tension. And if it is in tension, it has a good ductility. Concrete starts to have ductility. So very simple. You take concrete and you confine it. And you have a high strength material. And you have a material with high ductility. What can be more simpler than that? So if you take a steel pipe and put concrete on it, that becomes a very good material, very, very good material because it increases the compression capacity of concrete and also the utility of concrete. So the only way for that to fail is for the pipe to fail around its, because of the boot tension, correct? And that is the, the way that we can increase the utility of and strength of concrete. So this is what we are saying here, that this is the behavior of unconfined concrete of different capacities, different, different strengths. So as you can see that when we increase the strength of concrete, it actually becomes less, less ductile, it becomes more brittle. So high strength concrete becomes more brittle. It has high strength, but more ductility. Very low strength concrete may have better so you can see from here that the various strain point zero here it goes down to 0 0.002, 0 0.001. So 0 0.003 failure strain that the this VS code was saying is not really true. If the concrete is high strength, concrete may fail at this point. And as you can see, actually the stress strain curve drops, it doesn't just end there. And this is unconfined concrete. So first thing we we learn is that concrete strength, when we increase concrete strength, it becomes more brittle. The strain at breaking becomes less, so it breaks more at a smaller strain. So high strength concrete, not good by itself, because it becomes brittle. And it also fails at a smaller strain, so it cannot deform much. Correct? So that's the first thing we learn. But if we combine high strength concrete with confinement, we can get many benefits. So, this is with confinement. So, if you take the concrete and confine it well, you can get a very nice round stress strain curve and it can go later. This is the unconfined behavior. And if we confine it, we can increase this length. And you can also make this go up. All right. So this is unconfined, ending at 0 0.0035, having this behavior. And after this point, this is the maximum. You see the very small amount. Utility is very small. Between this and this is very small. So it breaks immediately, or in less than one, or in less than two. Right. And what we want is we want higher utility. So how do we confine now? Like I mentioned, you put concrete in a cylinder, right? Steel cylinder, confine it. 
then concrete cannot go anywhere. You just cannot break it until you break the cylinder, steel cylinder. Correct? And that is, so when you push concrete, it will push outside. When you press it, it will have forces, and this will expand this, and that will confine it, and then you will have hoop stresses, and it will just like water pressure. So concrete starts to behave like water in a, in a, in a, in a tank. Right? And if you cut that off, then force here will be equal to this value. Right? Summation of all the horizontal components of all the force divided by 2, that will be the force here. Right? And you can then calculate from this area and yields capacity, we can calculate the maximum confinement pressure that we can generate. And second is that if we cannot do confinement, we can confine it concrete like this by square stirrups or square cylinder. In that case, concrete will press here, here and here, and it will be slight deformation like this. So the stress <coughs> variation will be there. It is not as good as that, but it, this will still be confining it diagonally. But it will not be full confinement because the bars can bend in between because of the pressure. So it cannot generate. So diagonally, it will generate the confinement pressures. Right? So this is a square hoop can also be used. So we can, we can either put a steel tube or we can just put stirrups, hoops around wires or bars around the column. Could be circular or could be square. Or we can do double confinement. We can take concrete, put some bars here and put hoops here and another hoops here. So the green concrete becomes confined and grey concrete becomes unconfined. Now this is very interesting because within one cross section you have created now concrete of two types. When you cast it, it has that same strength. After confinement, green concrete has much higher strength and ductility than grey concrete. Now the cross section design and analysis becomes very complicated. Which concrete property do you use? Right? The green or the gray. And how do you analyze this complicated situation? And then there are also vertical bars and there are these two hoops. How do you calculate the confinement from this effect? But this is quite common in bridges. When we use brick, big bridge piers, we put hoops of this kind, multiple hoops, and confine the concrete like this. Because if you use one big stirrup, it will not be effective. Circular confinement is much more effective, obviously. So we use two circular confinements rather than using that rectangular confinement which will not work. So basically confinement is the key to improving the ductility of concrete. And ductility is the key to improving the seismic performance of structures. So confinement becomes very important in the whole process of reinforced concrete design and performance. So after that, you will hear me say often that confinement is very critical. Confinement is very important. So we will concentrate on confinement quite a bit to improve the performance of concrete because of the effect on ductility. Sometimes we put one step is not enough. We put more steps so we can reduce this deformation between the steps. And then also we can, this stirrups, vertically they have small spacing to increase the confinement in between. So the whole cage, the bar cage inside the column becomes very important in confinement. Now most engineers, maybe you also, always thought that putting the vertical bars will help to carry the load because the vertical bars have this cross section area, so the total capacity of concrete of column is calculated by concrete multiplied by stress plus steel multiplied by stress, right? But now we know that is not really correct because a lot of the strength can come by the reinforcement which is placed perpendicular to the cross section because that will add confinement and increase the concrete strength and that will get another benefit. And this is something that people do not understand and do not use. 
So they do not worry too much about stirrups. They worry about vertical bars. In fact, horizontal bars have more advantage in column increased capacity and ductility than vertical bars. And that is because of the confinement effect of the horizontal bars. So the one thing that you must remember and learn today is that in columns, horizontal reinforcement is extremely important. It is very critical for performance of columns, more so than the vertical bars, because this gives ductility. Vertical bars actually reduce ductility. Horizontal bars give ductility and also increase strength. And sometimes we create confinement like this. So that means, now we always have a case in a column that part of the concrete is unconfined, part of the concrete is confined. You have to use two different concrete models. One for confined, one for unconfined. And that makes it very difficult to do the analysis. We will learn how we can handle cross-sections with different concrete sections later. And sometimes we allow this concrete to fail first, and we do not allow this to fail. So this can fail first, and this can remain. So we allow multiple failure of the column. First, the outer core, outside cover will go, and core will remain. And then the core will take the load. So we have two design levels, with outer portion and without outer portion. So, now confinement, look at this, this is concrete without confinement, little bit confinement, more confinement, more confinement, more confinement. Imagine from point 0035 somewhere here, we can go up to a strain of point 0.03, 10 times more than that. So we add the ductility of 10 to concrete, which had only ductility of 1, or less than 1, or 2. We can increase the ductility up to that, in fact, even beyond that, up to 0 0.5. So 15 times we can increase the ductility of concrete, same strength of concrete, same concrete, by adding horizontal reinforcement. So, and strength can go from this one up to 7,000. So 4,500 up to 7,000 using the same concrete, right? So that is the advantage or effect of adding confinement. This confinement, no confinement, 4.57 inches spacing, 3.5, of course this is a lot of confinement, but the effect is also great, right? So this, is, this becomes as good as steel. So which means, like last time I said, that we can actually make the, the materials or concrete behave like steel by using the confinement effects. All right. So this is one of the important considerations. Now the next question will be, the next lecture will be, how do we use this information in the analysis of the sections, on the capacity, on the curvature, and those kind of things. But the first important thing is to be able to generate a stress strain curve with confinement. Different models, that was given by one confinement model. This is given by another confinement model. Again, you can see here, Kent and Park. They do not increase the strength, but they increase the ductility. Right? This is another confinement model. They are saying that the strength does not increase, but the ductility increases. Different approach, different way of calculating this. Right? Because they are saying strength, you should not use the extra strength, but use the ductility. And again, it can go very high, very, very high, 0 0.012, 0 0.018, and so on. So it can go on and on, keep on going. So different people have different models for determining the confinement. And so from here to there we can see the effect of confinement. This became that by confinement. Right? Over there we have to use different concrete strength to get high strength. Here we only use confinement to get better behavior. And 
High strength actually reduces ductility. Low strength with confinement gives you the best results. So that means if you want a good behavior, good confinement, do not use high strength materials. Use medium strength materials with, with confinement and ductility that will give you the best performance. High strength material is not a good thing for earthquake resistant design actually. We will find later. We don't want strength, we want utility. In fact, strength is not good. We want to reduce the strength. This is Mentor model, Mentor develop this equation for calculating the stress for strain. So this equation can be used to generate that curve for different regions, which includes the effect of the confinement also. So now we can see very clearly main concrete and confined concrete. Same concrete after confinement can go up to this level. And you can see the increase in ductility, you can increase see the increase in strength. Another issue. So that's so far we covered one issue when we load the concrete only in one direction. We keep on loading it and it has confinement and it has ductility and everything. What happens if we load and unload concrete many times? This is what happens to concrete. Right? You load it, you bring it back, it does not go there. Next time you load it, it goes like this, like this. And after some cycles, it starts to become like that. That means this is called degradation. Degradation is the biggest enemy of concrete. Most materials do not have degradation. Concrete has degradation. Degradation means that you have every loading and unloading, its strength and its stiffness drops. And that is called degradation, degrades. The concrete degrades. So this cyclic degradation of concrete causes the concrete to be not the same first time, second time, third time it becomes like that and then it, its ductility and its stress strain curve drop. <clears throat> this is very important for earthquake because earthquake is exactly doing that. Loading, unloading, loading, unloading, shaking. Loading, unloading, loading, unloading. So after a few cycles, concrete starts to degrade. And the properties that we used in the beginning are no longer true. Strength becomes low, utility becomes low, stiffness becomes low, and that effect produces this curve. We call it backbone curve. So normally, if it was supposed to be like this, actually now it will become like that. So this is the stress strain curve for monotonic loading. It has to be adjusted for cyclic loading. So this, the top of each cycle, if we connect them together, is called the backbone. So we are normally interested in backbone curve, right? That is the connection of all of the cycles top, and we should be able to estimate that. So now we have several problems at hand. First of all, if you apply stress strain to concrete it has stress or stress to concrete has strain if you unload it and come back again it does not go to the same place and also you have confinement effect you have ductility effect you have brittleness effect everything must be considered while we develop the final concrete model to be used for calculation right so for today just enough for you to know this one, okay? We will come back to these things gradually when we use it. So, just to remind you on the codes, use very simple things. Now you have seen everything. Now if you go back to the code, you will say, oh, what are they doing? They don't know anything. And that's what I told you in the beginning. The codes are very simple. They are using extremely simplified formulations, extremely simplified equations, limited application. Look at that and look at the reality. So, 
steel, different steel. Last thing, temperature. I, I mentioned to you that all of this that we have seen so far, stress strain curve, uh, activity, uh, degradation, it is all going to be affected by temperature on top of that. So if the temperature is high, the, the material may behave differently. Steel may become more ductile, low strength. Concrete may become more brittle, low strength. So different materials behave differently when subjected to high temperatures. Right? They also expand, they also change their properties. Plastic modulars, everything changes. So this will end the discussion on materials and next we next time we will start cross sections. But any questions about materials? Anything that you are not clear?